Hi, this is Tony Trishka, and you're listening to Bluegrass Jamalong, the podcast for anyone and everyone who plays bluegrass. Hey, everybody, got a fantastic interview for you this week with Tony Trishka, and that is coming right up. But first, I just wanted to thank a couple of people for making this happen. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank Lisa Kinsman who went to a Baylor Flack show and ended up sitting next to Tony and had a chat with him and his agent, um, Carla, who does all Tony's publicity, and just asked if he'd be interested in being on this podcast because she'd love to hear him on it and put me in touch. And that's how this interview happened. And that's just a glorious little thing to have happened. So thanks, Lisa, for taking the time to do that. And that's amazing. Um, thanks, Carla, for your help in setting this up. And... Thanks to Tony for doing this. Um, yeah, here comes the interview. So welcome to Bluegrass Jam Along, Tony Trishka. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, man. Thanks for having me. It's a delight and it's a joy to, to have you here. Um, I could easily spend an hour introducing you and listing all the things you've done and the people you've played with and the influences you've had on Bluegrass. Um, but I'm really keen to talk about your, uh, your last project, uh, Shall We Hope? So... I'd like to crack on with that. Um, there is, however, a really cool Artist Works podcast that you did with Patricia Butler, sort of, which goes into some more of the background and how you got started on banjo. So I think I'll link to that through the show notes and people can go and listen to that too because there's some really good stuff on there. Um, and it's really interesting to hear the background too. Um, but what I really want to talk about um, is the record Shall We Hope, which was released in summer of 2021. Mm-hmm. And it's definitely uh, an experience as much as a record. Um and I'd love for you just to talk a little bit about the sort of the, the the record in general, really, how it came about. But just to sort of start off, for people who haven't heard it, describe it because it's quite an unusual project in many ways. Well, the album evolved out of just writing one tune, basically. But just to give a somewhat of an overall uh, of the of the project, um, it basically is. Uh, takes place during the Civil War for the most part. Um, And uh, basically this was coming at a time when there was some social unrest in the United States. And I just sort of wanted to address that as well. Um, The Black Lives Matter issues like that. Um, And just all all the divisiveness in our country. Uh, And that, you know, we need to heal. We need to come together. And that as as things evolved, that became the focal point of this whole, this whole story. Um, <clears throat> uh, so it basically tells the story of uh, uh, a husband who is a riverboat gambler, gambler and um, ends up uh, meeting a woman uh, who's come from Ireland because her husband died in a mine cave and they get together and, um, they have a child and he goes off to war. Uh, and, and simultaneously with that, um, I switch about a third of the way through, uh, to the story of, uh, an enslaved African who was a grave digger, uh, in Asheville, North Carolina, and how, um, he kills his enslaver and escapes and goes to union lines, uh, and fights in the battle of Gettysburg. Um, and then there's, uh, basically as I was researching this, I found a video of, uh, veterans of the, of the, um, Gettysburg battle with, uh, folks from the Confederacy, old gentlemen from the Confederacy and union soldiers. And there's a video of them shaking hands over the stone wall at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, uh, while, uh, uh, well, it was the 75th anniversary um, of the battle and just this healing of these gentlemen, maybe their attitudes hadn't changed, but here they were on opposite sides during the civil war. And here they were, they were shaking hands and kind of fooling around with each other. And, you know, I mean, they were in their eighties and nineties. So, Mm. um, and it was just a very moving thing for me and it, it became, uh, sort of an overlay for the whole project. And so I decided to start, uh, with a song that, called this favored land, which, uh, talks about that, that, uh, meeting of these both sides. And then it goes back in time to the riverboat gambler and tells this whole story about Gettysburg. And then at the end, um, 
But, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was president uh, in 1938, came to this gathering, this reunion, and gave a speech. And so I um, had someone read that speech, part of that speech, to finish off the album as well. A guy named uh, an actor named John Lithgow. Uh, so, kind of go, starts once uh, one period of time and goes back in time, and then comes back at the end to back to 1938. Yeah, and it it works so beautifully as a like maybe in a way that people don't necessarily listen to music now but it works as a as a whole piece start to finish it's quite immersive and it's almost like listening to a, a song cycle you know a schubert song cycle or something where you can listen to all the individual pieces as individual pieces and they sound lovely and there's lots to get out of them and lots of detail and lots of story and lots of character but um but when you put them together end to end it's a you know it's a, an actual experience isn't it and it that's that's relatively rare these days i think yeah, I you know, I mean, I've, I've done certainly albums where there's, it's just a variety of songs that don't connect. But um, I did an album in 1993, I guess it was called um, um, World Turning, which was a history mm-hmm. of the band starting in Africa and going through to modern times. Uh, and so it's not the first time I've done something like this, but this was the most expansive. And plus that was almost, not completely, but almost all instrumental what was new for me is writing lyrics. I mean, these are songs, they're not instrumentals. There's one march that's an instrumental, but everything is, else is a song. And I wrote most of the songs on there with lyrics, which was a challenge. And um, and uh, 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 one I gladly accepted for myself. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was just interesting to see... Uh, if I could pull it off and I, I, you know, I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out, if I may say that. Uh, and uh, I definitely anyway, say you pulled it, it off. Was, yeah. And, and so, yeah, I, and I like the idea of having, uh, you know, and I, I want to do more of this sort of thing. You know, I don't want to call it a concept album. That's a little pretentious or whatever, but that sort of a thing. Yeah. As you said, a song cycle or something like that, where there's an interconnectedness between the pieces. Yeah, it's a bit, a bit like a, sort of, when you listen to Blind Leaving the Blind, the Punch Brothers sort of full movement. Mm-hmm. It's a similar thing. There's an arc. You can go on through the whole thing that there's a sort of sense of um, some sort of release at the end. It's it's sort of there's a, you know, a, a start and an end and the journey you go on. And that's a very satisfying thing to do. Um, did you have the complete arc of it in your head before you started writing the songs? Or did it, you, you remember you said it grew out of like a particular song you wrote first? Yeah, the album before this one uh, was called Great Big World, and I wrote two. I wrote lyrics to two songs on there, one about Wild Bill Hickok, the Western hero, uh, and I really enjoyed doing that. And then I started thinking, after that album came out, well, maybe I'll write a song about a riverboat gambler, and that's the first thing I wrote. And, you know, here I am in the mid-1800s writing about that. And then uh, I just... It was actually a Disney movie when I was a kid, but it was called The Great Train Robbery or something like that, which wasn't why I was going after it. But I happened to find this story about this these Union soldiers who hijacked, if you can hijack a train, you can only go in one direction, you know, forward or backward, but they hijacked a train and, uh, and tore up uh, tracks down in northern Georgia uh, to impede this Confederate battle that was going to happen or attack that was going to happen. Uh, and I wrote those two songs and then, okay, I'm in the mid 1800s and, and I'm not a civil war buff per se. I'm not an expert on the civil war, but I'm, I have a fascination with it anyway. And so I said, uh, well, let's see where this goes from here. And then I wrote the song about this woman coming from Ireland and it just grew out of that. And I wanted to have this, you know, an enslaved aspect to this, to talk about that and deal with that issue. And I wasn't sure how to get into that. And um, I was visiting some friends in Nashville, North Carolina, and the husband uh, was a historian, a history professor at Warren Wilson College there. And uh, that night he said, oh, tomorrow morning, if you'd like, I can take you to the slave graveyard that we've been clearing uh, with his history students. And I went, I would love to do that. So we went over there the next morning and it was just on the outskirts of Asheville. There was this old church there and we go to this field where there are just these stones on the ground. And those marked, those were markers for people that were buried there. There were no headstones, at least for this large part of this field. 
Uh, and the, he said that the uh, enslaved people were put in wicker baskets and buried under the ground. And he did a seismic reading and discovered there were 1,900 bodies under the ground. Wow. Uh, and so, uh, and there was this guy named George Avery, who was the grave digger who was enslaved. And um, I won't go into all the details of it, but basically I, I based the uh, the story, that part of the story on George Avery, although I changed his name to John Boston, which is another story. But <laughs> anyway, that gave me the sort of that central fulcrum for that part of the story about the enslaved Africans. And as you, as you wrote the songs, were you writing for the voices that ended up on the record or did that sort of come later, the sort of the collaborations with, with the people who got involved? You mean the other musicians I got involved yeah, with? Yeah, were you sort of writing with people in mind to sing the songs or did the songs no, come I, first? And... No, I wrote, uh, wrote for the characters in mm. the story. You know, I wanted to tell their story. <clears throat> And of course, you know, I had this woman from Ireland. Uh, and so I, of course, would use Maura O'Connell, who's one of the all time great Irish singers. Mm. Uh, and I believe she's, if not fully retired, somewhat retired, but uh, she was willing to do this because we I've known her for a million years. Uh, she used to be with a group called the Dannon. Uh, and then Michael Daves he sings on a lot of this and he, we're good friends and he's uh, close by here in the, uh, I'm in New Jersey. He's in New York. And uh, so I used him and we play a lot together and he's got mm -hmm. an amazing voice and he added so much and a great guitar player. So, but I was, I was just telling the story. I wasn't writing, in, you know, thinking in terms of people's voices at that point. Mm. Yeah. Michael has got an incredible voice. It's very, um, it sounds, it sounds of now and of also a hundred years ago at the same time, he's got a, a sort of certain, just there's a depth there that just feels very authentic. Um, I, I love hearing it. It's a really good point. You, I, just, I hadn't thought of it that way, but you're absolutely right. It is current, but also goes way back. Yeah. So, he, he feels like he's been around for a long time. There's, there's an old sort of an old soul in there musically, at least I don't know, Michael, but you know, there's, there's a lot of, um, a lot of feels like there's a lot of history to the way he sings and the way he plays. Exactly. You're, you're so right. And he, and he can stretch and play, he can play jazzy things or straight bluegrass. And it, it just, it, it was perfect for this project because it's not a three chord project. I mean, there there's mm. some string quartet things that have very involved chords and, and there's some straight ahead bluegrassy kind of things too, but he can go in any direction and, and make it work. Yeah. There's a real, a real variety to it. And, and like maybe given the title, I was, you know, slightly naively on my part, but I was surprised by just how much joy there is in it and how much, sort of light as well as as well as shade and there's a lot of um it's, it's you know it's difficult subject matter and there's a lot of pain in those stories but there's also a lot of hope and a lot of light as well yeah that's that's what i tried to bring to it but it, it it's a dark time in, in america's history and uh it's you know it's not exactly a cheery topic uh there's one <clears throat> there's one song in there that is sort of a recreation of a, a minstrel sort of a sound, although sung by a black, uh, that's sort of a nonsense thing. I try to come up with some nonsense lyrics, like old Dan Tucker, you know, yeah. uh, just these nonsensical lyrics. And, and then the whole, uh, just the whole aspect of it, trying to, you know, people can heal, we can get together again. And in the last speech, uh, even though we were under different flags, we're under one flag now, uh, that sort of thing. And originally the, the album was called This Favored Land, <clears throat> that was the working title in my mind for a number of years because I was looking for a title for this. And I had some, uh, I had a book of Lincoln's Abraham Lincoln speeches and found a, a line in there in his second inaugural address where he talks about the America being this favored land. And I really liked that title. And then as time went on, I was like, this is not a favored land for a lot of people here. So mm -hmm. uh, wonderful as our country is, there's a, a lot of, negative aspects to it. So, uh, I didn't want to, I decided, um, I needed a different title and, uh, I had my wife and some other people looking and, and, uh, have a book of poems by Phyllis Wheatley, uh, who, uh, was an enslaved Africa who came, was brought to Boston. She was like 13 years old in tatters. And, uh, she ended up living with this, uh, family in Boston was taught, to speak English and write, and she became a poet. And 
wrote and sent a poem to George Washington, who wrote her back. And it's like an amazing story. Uh, and in one of her poems, there was just a line, shall we hope? And they said, they said that's it right there. So anyway, nice. that's how you know, that became the title. And it's, it's really interesting here. You talk earlier about um, sort of divisive, polarized times that we live in now. And then not just in your country, in my country too, there's very much a taking of sides that feel unnecessary when there's so much common ground in the middle, but we cling to the bits that we differ upon rather than the things that we don't for some reason that I can't quite fathom, but we do. And, and it's interesting here. You talk about the sort of the, the wanting to address some of that in the writing of it. Um, and, and I guess, you know, it, that brings a new depth to the, to bring, and I need to go back now and listen to it again with that in mind, but just the idea that if a country can heal from something as, all encompassing as a civil war, then we ought to be able to come together over things that are somehow less um, immediately catastrophic, even though some of the sentiments underneath them and some of the, the divides are very real. If a country can heal from a civil war, we should learn something from that. Yeah, I think so. I mean, some people say the civil war is still being fought in some people's minds, you know, mm. but, all these years later, 150 years, 60 years later, whatever it is now. Um, and for all of our differences, we're all in this together. We're all going to end up in the same place and we all struggle and have joys. And, um, you know, it used to be, you know, in the sixties I had long hair and it would be the hippies versus the straights or the, the rednecks versus the whatever. There are all these, there's always been divisiveness, but I just can't think of a time when it was, I mean, besides the civil war, of course, where it's been this polarized and it's just politicians that are doing it and just pitting one person against the other. And there, there's a lot of the stuff that's under the surface, but, um, uh, well, we could get off on a tangent on that, but I won't, uh, but in the end we have to respect each other, no matter how much we differ. You know, I have some people I know that are very strong, uh, supporters on the other side and we can still get along and okay. So we just don't talk about that. So anyway, yeah, we, we have to just respect each other as individuals mm. and the humanity in each of us. And I think or, um, a big element of understanding anybody is is understanding their story. And this is a record full of different different stories that came together in this historical sort of moment. And I think there's uh, there's a I can't remember who said it, but there's a sort of famous quote that you can like anybody if you know their story. Right. And and that attempt to understand where people have come from what they've been through and where they are at that moment in time they're talking to you from whatever perspective they've got that's not your perspective um the more of that we can understand the better um i'm really interested to know whether because this is a record that came out in a time where we couldn't come together and people were very separated and i wondered if any of it felt like it took on a different resonance for you in that because it is you know there's it's a different kind of being divided it's not a division by choice but it's still very much a physical division from each other we'll be right back with you just after this bluegrass jam along is proud to be sponsored by collings guitars and mandolins if you're attending the nam show in january stop by the collings booth to say hello to the team get hands-on with their selection of customized acoustics and electrics and check out some exciting new prototypes they're working on for 2024 they'll also have a few of their world-class artists on hand demoing various instruments and if you can't attend, don't forget to follow their Instagram and Facebook accounts throughout the show for photos, videos, and the latest news. Collins guitars are hand-built from the sound up in Austin, Texas. This episode is also brought to you by Peghead Nation, the home of Roots Music Instruction. If one of your 2024 resolutions is to improve as a musician, Peghead Nation is the place to go. They have 65 streaming video courses for guitar, mandolin, banjo, fiddle, dobro, bass and ukulele from some of the leading names in acoustic music. Courses cover bluegrass, old time, Irish music and swing, plus lessons dedicated to improvisation, theory and ear training. Your first course is just $20 a month and you can add more for $10. Try any course free for a month with the promo code JAMALONG. Make 2024 a year of more music at pegheadnation.com. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this took, this was 12 years in the making from the time I wrote the first song. It took 12 years for it to come out. Uh, so I can't say that the pandemic was, you know, 
entered into it, but it was interesting that in the end, the, that was sort of the uh, overlay or underlay either way uh, mm. when it came out. And it was frustrating because it came out in January of 21 and I couldn't tour when it, to support it. It was like, okay, well, <laughs> here we are. So I, I did some Zoom concerts from home, that sort of a thing. We mm. talked about it. Uh, I'm fascinated to know how you would have taught it if it would have been a more theatrical experience potentially, or would you, would you have taught it as a full sort of piece? Uh, that's a really good question. You know, it still hasn't happened after all this time because it's a daunting undertaking. And, uh, mm. I've talked to a few people about turning it into a theatrical production, uh, which hasn't happened yet. I mean, it's just, it's a different world. I don't exist in that world, but I, mm. um, uh, it almost happened this coming July. We were going to mount, uh, mount it for one performance, but uh, because of people's schedules, it didn't work out. But I would like to do that. In other words, to produce this properly, the way the album is, I'd need a string quartet. I need a five piece bluegrass band, mm. and, uh, a narrator, at least one, probably two narrators. I mean, it's, it's a, a big operation. Yeah, and it yeah. can be done. I would be, I will be able to do it. Uh, I mentioned this project I was working on uh, a, a long time ago, this history of the banjo show. And, mm. uh, and I actually toured that with a narrator. I had a five piece band and in some cases I had a dancer and a narrator. So I've done something like that, but not on this scale. Uh, but I would like to have it become a theatrical presentation. And I'm, I am talking to some people. Uh, and did, did the sort of the history of the banjo project, did that lead in any way to the give me the banjo documentary? Um, which I, I watched last week and absolutely loved. Oh, great. Uh, yeah, it did, as a matter of fact, because um, I did an element of it for a public television, local public television in New Jersey when I was living in New York City. And this gentleman who worked there saw it and was who worked um, in the production of the, of the show uh, is also a documentarian. And he thought, thought well, this could be something. And I did a uh, did the show at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, and he filmed some of it there. Uh, and then we started talking, and hey, let's do a doc let's do a real full blown documentary on this uh, on the history of the banjo. So yeah, so that album actually led to this. Give me the banjo. Uh, yeah. So for PBS, but people who haven't seen that. It's a you know sort of feature length documentary on the history of the banjo and and people who sort of moved the banjo on in some form and played a, a part in its story. And it's a, you know, it's a, a really, anybody who knows a bit about the banjo will know much of it already, but some, just the detail and the people involved and, you know, how much sort of richness and, and history is there is to what a lot of people see as a relatively new instrument. And, you know, one of the, you know, only a couple of instruments that could genuinely be considered American instruments. I interviewed Wes Corbett last week and he said, you know, it's sort of generally held that the theremin and the banjo are the only two <laughs> genuinely American instruments. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a fascinating watch, really interesting. Um, and so much, and, and Wes also said he, he really encourages anybody who takes up the banjo to go and study the history of it and understand culturally where it's come from and, and how it became what it is. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think I think it's important. In other words, the African roots of the banjo are not as well known, although Pete Seeger in his very famous banjo book, which was the first book I got, uh, and came out in 1948, he actually discusses it there, which I, when I was a kid and got it, I didn't focus on that and didn't think about it. But I, in recent times, I went back. He was talking about this back then. They came from Africa and from Western Africa. So, yeah, it's, you know, you don't have to know the history, but it just adds a whole other dimension to the whole thing. And um, I, back in the 70s, I mean, first I fell in love with the banjo through uh, the Kingston Trio, their banjo mm -hmm. player, Dave Gart, took a solo on one of their tunes and it was a finger picking thing. And I was playing folk guitar and then it was like, oh, I have to do this. I have to play the banjo. What was I thinking all these years at the age of 13? And um, and then, uh, well, here, where do I hear more of this? Oh, there's this guy, Earl Scruggs, you should listen to. Oh, okay. So I started listening to Earl Scruggs and Scruggs. And, um, and then, you know, and then got into more progressive things, trying to stretch boundaries. And then somewhere in the early to mid-70s, I started discovering 
the, the classic style of banjo playing that took place at the turn of the century, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s, and was fascinated by that a whole different style. Parlor music, you know, ragtime marches and light classical music, that sort of thing. And I thought that was as far back as we knew what happened with the banjo, you know, in any kind of documented way. And then I went to something called the Tennessee Banjo Institute in 1990, which is just a gathering of a million banjo players. And Ralph Stanley was there and Bela was there and just all sorts of folks. But there were these guys playing, quote, minstrel style music or, or a stroke style music. Uh, and they had these books from the 18, mid 1800s, you know, 1855 right. was banjo instruction book. I knew nothing about this. And it was this really powerful experience. Like, wow, they knew what was going on 50 years before anything I'd heard about. And you could hear the African roots in the music. And then it just completed the whole timeline for me. So it was really an amazing experience to, you know, to get this whole thing starting from, you know, let's say the mid 1800s on through to today. Mm. And of course you could hear the roots going back before that, where it wasn't documented. So anyway. And it's really interesting because, you know, of, banjo is one of those instruments that within a few notes can conjure up a certain thing for a lot of people. It's a very strong, distinctive sound. And particularly if you hear sort of five string, three finger banjo played within a few notes for a lot of people, there's, there's only one connotation and that's a certain kind of, um, a certain kind of music from a certain area of the United States. And, and partly that is some of the stereotypes from, how it's been portrayed. And I'd, I'd be interested to to talk to you about that for a minute, just because not just banjo, but, but bluegrass in general, because there've been some cultural moments where bluegrass and the banjo have sort of come to the forefront. And, and you know, the Beverly Hillbillies is probably responsible for some of that. And Deliverance is probably responsible for some of that. And for my generation, it's probably more, oh brother, we're out now. But there's mm -hmm. been a, you know, a, a strong arc of, of these moments that just thrust it into the spotlight for a bit. Um, and and from looking back from my perspective, you see those oh brother, where are now type peaks or a deliverance type peak. And did it did it feel like that at the time? Did it feel like those were moments where suddenly everything was thrust into the spotlight, or is that something that people have put on it a little bit with the rose tinted specks of history? <laughs> no, I think I think it's I think that's accurate. I mean, Foggy Mountain Breakdown <clears throat> in Bonnie and Clyde that was one of the hmm. seismic moments. Uh, and as you say, Beverly Hillbillies, that's how Bela Fleck got into the banjo suit, the Beverly mm. Hillbillies. <clears throat> and that's a pretty powerful influence right there. Uh, and as you say, uh, dueling banjos, of course, many people got into it through that. The fact that that could be number one on the radio is mm. today, like, how did that happen? <clears throat> and Eric Weisberg, who was the banjo player on that, didn't even know that that was out. He uh, right. was asked to play on the soundtrack, went down to Northern Georgia and played on, on, I think, I guess he recorded it, you know, in New York city, but went down and, uh, had to teach the kid who's in the movie to look like he was playing the banjo, but apparently the kid just wanted to hang out behind a barn and smoke cigarettes. Wasn't that interested in looking like he was learning how to look out of he was playing anyway. And Eric was a big studio musician in New York city. Uh, and so one day someone said, Hey, Eric, your song's all over the radio. What? And Warner Brothers had released it as a single, unbeknownst to Eric, and suddenly he's on the charts without even knowing it. So anyway, that's uh, another story. Uh, but th these days, or in more recent times, I feel like Steve Martin has helped to bring a lot of people to the banjo. That's not mm. like a, it's not like a big bang like those other things, but it's a, a slow and steady thing. Here's this famous movie star playing the banjo, and and touring, and putting mm. out albums. Oh. And, and playing with, with the kind of musicians who, you know, uh, you will only see playing with somebody they respect, you know, but, you know, you're not going to get the kind of musicians he plays with playing with him just for a gig. It's, right. you know, and what I hadn't realized is that, you know, banjo has been part of his act since the really early days of the folk clubs in the sixties. You know, I'd, I'd sort of had it in my head that banjo was a more recent thing for him, but it's been part of his life for a long time, isn't it? Yeah. Well, he started when he was in high school, he and John McEwen, as I, if I understand this correctly, went to high school together, John McEwen from the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. And I think maybe John showed him some things on the banjo, but so he's been playing since high school. Hmm. And I did a show in New York city with a band that was in at the time called breakfast special. This was in 1974. 
And we shared the bill with this comedian named Steve Martin in 74. And it was just a small little club in Greenwich Village. And he had the arrow through the head and was playing banjo. And I remember talking to him afterwards. And then, oh, wow, look what happened to him. He got kicked upstairs. So, no, he's been doing it for a long time. And he's a wonderful banjo player. And he he not he can play Foggy Mountain Breakdown and Shuck in the Corn and some of the standard bluegrass things. But he feels like, well... A lot of people can do that. Let me do my own thing. And he started writing mm. his own songs. And uh, he's, he's a wonderful, uh, well, songwriter and, and tune writer. You know, he writes his own banjo music. And he's a wonderful claw hammer player as well. So, uh, no, he's all kudos to Steve. He's, it's not it's not like, well, I play a little banjo. Well, it's Steve Martin. Yeah, as you said, let's get the Steep Canyon Rangers to back him up. And yeah. <laughs> he's good. He's truly good. And yeah, he yeah. thinks so. And I think um, that's interesting to hear you say that about, you know, he sort of looks at some of the, the tunes and thinks, well, other people do that. What what can I bring that's me? And that's right. that's your job as a musician, as an artist, is to do whatever mix of stuff is uniquely you, because nobody else can do that. And yeah. that's always that's always good to hear. Um, and it, it does feel, you know, I don't have a, a long history with bluegrass music. And I, you know, wasn't brought up. I was brought up in the north of England listening to the Beatles. And, but... But it definitely feels like there's a a lot of interest in the banjo now that seen, since, you know, there's various points you can look back to and identify, but since Baylor Fleck decided he was going to really push the boundaries of what he thought he could do and what people could see it doing. But but since that, some of the stuff Noam Kelly's doing, for example, which is almost taking it into a chamber kind of feel with the Punch Brothers stuff, there's some very composed, very sort of clean textures going on there that people don't necessarily so associate with the banjo and you know the work Wes Corbett's doing and the work you continue to do it feels like there's a lot of um, really cool banjo stuff happening at the moment yeah I, I think uh, things are really it's, the banjo is really healthy at this point you know it's funny because one thing that's helped to legitimize it and I was mentioning this to someone the other day uh, when I, I lived in New York City for 16 years and I remember walking down 88th street one time with my banjo and someone looked over at me and went, yeehaw, you know, like this is a hillbilly instrument. Where are the bales of hay and this sort of mm-hmm. thing. And people had that image of it. And, uh, but you know, I was playing some Beethoven and some Bach on the banjo in the seventies. And, but it was really Bela who brought it to prominence by composing these concertos and, you know, and putting the banjo, you know, playing with the Philadelphia orchestra. And I can remember, listening to our local uh, NPR station, public radio station, on this classical channel somewhere maybe in the 80s or something, and there was a fundraising drive. And they said, if you don't, if we don't get $10,000 in the next hour, we're going to play some banjo music. Hmm. It was like a threat. It was a threat. Yeah. Money or we're, we're going to play the banjo. And then and I remember hearing Bale, one of Bale's concertos on that same station all those many years later, you know five years later or whatever. I mean, five years ago, something like that. So it's like the balance has shifted. And of course, Baylor playing with Chakria and, mm. and doing black tones. And he's done so much on a, on a large scale uh, to bring the banjo to the world you know, as a legitimate instrument, going to Africa, et cetera, et cetera. And he just um, played at Carnegie Hall in January, you know, mm. with my dress heart. So. And that, that sort of lit- did that word legitimate? I think it's really interesting, sort of legitimizing the banjo because it's it's um, you know, the guitar and mandolin and fiddle and double bass all have a classical orchestral lineage of some kind and are accepted in those roles. But a banjo, people aren't used to seeing it, haven't been used to seeing it in that sort of context, and it's it definitely feels like um, something people are particularly keen to push is the idea that this is an instrument you should be taking seriously. It's not just a sort of corny sound off a few movies in the seventies. It's it's an instrument with large capabilities and a bunch of really fascinating people seeing what they can do with it. Yeah, I, I mean, when you talk about the guitar, oh, you play the guitar, you so you play rock and roll, it, or you know, people's that's not what you think. Oh, it could be rock, it could be classical, it could be folk, mm-hmm. it could be blue. You know? And the banjo is sort of thought in one way, but well, no, you can play classical music on it. You can play salsa music. You can play. Brazilian music on it. I play Soros on the banjo, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's, it's a musical instrument, just like any other. And hmm. we're starting to get that. <laughs> yeah. All these years uh, later. And it'd be really interesting sort of as a, a sort of 
follow on from that to talk a little bit about um because part of that is is down to how it's been taught of is you talk talk about Pete Seeger's sort of famous book, um, which kicked it all off. But it's definitely like banjo is is something that maybe there's been slightly less material out there previously in terms of people learning how to play it. And, you know, there's been books written about how to play the fiddle for centuries and books written about how to play guitar or where to find the scales at least. Um, and and it's really interesting, you know, we're at the point now where people can log on to artist works and, and see dozens and dozens of videos from you, send you a video and get a response of you actually commenting on their playing. And I think right. I read somewhere that you've taught something like, 12,000 students over the years through artist works. And if you add that to the, you know, number of people who've encountered your books, your DVDs, your videos, um, it said, you know, it's a big, you know, I, I read somewhere as well that you taught Baylor at some point as well. And I wondered what it, what, what it was like when you first picked up a banjo, you know, apart from a book by Pete Seeger, what was out there? How did you learn how all this worked? <laughs> Yeah, I, I got the Pete Seeger book, and uh, I was 13 or 14 when I picked it up, and uh, I was playing folk guitar at that point. I was I actually worked on some Doc Watson things, um, but I was so hot for the banjo, and before I got the banjo, I had to wait till Christmas to get my banjo, my long neck banjo. So I retuned my guitar and worked out some Pete Seeger out of the book. I had the Pete Seeger book, and I worked it out on the guitar first, and then when I got my hands on the banjo... Um, I, I couldn't really make it work because he has a section on Scruggs style in there. And there's a, there's a one time two foggy mountain breakdown in there, but I couldn't really, I didn't understand how the tablature worked. It didn't make sense to me. Hmm. <clears throat> and my parents found me a banjo teacher. So they thought who he was more of a folk singer really, but he showed me some claw hammer and I, I had my hand in a really stiff claw. I like thought that's how you ap approach the banjo. But that's not what I wanted to do anyway. And I went to a hootenanny, a folk gathering at Syracuse University, where I grew up in Syracuse, New York. And there was this guy playing with a guitar player. He was playing bluegrass banjo. And that was it. I was, that's the guy. And I, I approached him and he gave me lessons. And the very first lesson he taught me, Eric Weisberg's version of Lonesome Road Blues, note for note. And there were all those Scruggs licks in there. And suddenly, here I have it in my own bare fingers here, because I wasn't wearing picks yet. And it was it was just like the light bulb went on and uh, that mm. took, you know, four or five months of lessons with this guy. And he knew all the styles. He knew Don, Don Reno's single string style <clears throat> and Bill Keith's melodic style and Scrug style. And he just opened the door. His name is Hal Glatzer. We, we stay in touch and we're still friends. So um, that one person just made it happen for me. That's amazing. Um, I'm lucky to find that person, you know, you may, if you, yeah. It took you six months more to find that person. It could be a different story. Um, and right. at what point did you sort of start teaching as well? And uh, I think my first lesson was, that I taught was in 1970. I, again, I was still in Syracuse, New York, and there was a group called the Buffalo Gals, originally the Buffalo Chip Kickers. They changed their name to, to more commercial Buffalo Gals, and they were an all-female bluegrass band. And their banjo player wanted, came to me one day and said, hey, I want to learn how to play the banjo. Can you teach me? And I said I don't teach. And she said, that's okay. I won't pay you. So, <laughs> and, uh, and so I started giving her lessons and then there was uh, the guitar player in that band, uh, also wanted banjo lessons. And, and I said, well, you know, I don't know. And she said, my, my grandmother sends me chocolate chip cookies once a week. I'll, I'll give you some of those. So that, so that's how I started off. And, uh, and I just went from there, you know, and it's, it's, it's not like, like my wife uh, taught, uh, uh, taught English, eighth grade English, basically, for 25 years. She, you know, you have to take courses. You have to learn how to teach when you're teaching mm. the way, you know, these kinds of instruments. You know, okay, I'll just start showing you stuff. And, and over time, you'll learn how to teach. And you'll learn a lot about how what you do. I just It was like two weeks ago, and I can't even remember what it was now. Someone on ArtistWorks was asking a question, and I had to figure out, well, how do I do that with? Oh, I never realized I did that that way. This is like two weeks ago. So even now I'm still learning how I do what I do so I can teach it. But uh, yeah, over time you start, start to get it together, do enough of it, write enough books and enough videos for homespun tapes and da, da, da. And yeah. Then, and it's great that so much of that homespun stuff is still there sort of available digitally to, you know, cause there's some, I think that now we don't have, 
physical product in the same way that we we did maybe as much that, that so that might disappear but i love that it's all there because there's some there's just a huge treasure trove of stuff in there oh yeah i mean he, he has bill monroe and, and mm. john hartford and sam bush on and on and on and you know it's the same thing it's, it's just nice to capture this while people are still alive um i have over 50 interviews uh on my site on the artist work site and you know with bill monroe from years gone by audio a lot of video stuff and some of these people have passed since so but at least we have their images and their words mm. years later so and there's a definite i definite sense i get the more people i interview for this podcast and the more i sort of learn about the bluegrass community there's a definite um <clears throat> sort of strong sense that if you know something you should pass it on and that people are there's a you know people feel very much part of a tradition where the people who came before showed them things and they're going to show them to the next bunch of people. And it, it continues, you know, um, and that's, that's a really lovely thing to see. We're, we're, when you were learning banjo with the players that you idolized available, could you go to a festival and meet the players that you were listening to on records? Yeah. Well, that's the thing about bluegrass as opposed to rock and roll or something like that. You can, you know, Bill Monroe would be standing outside of his bus, just standing there. You walk up mm. and shake and that sort of thing. Uh, a very powerful experience for me was when I was, uh, I was, would have been 17 and Bill Monroe was playing in New York city, which is about four hours from Syracuse and, uh, our guitar player and myself, we took a bus down and my gra grandmother happened to li live on Washington square North in Greenwich village. And we went to the gaslight to see Bill Monroe over two nights, which was about four blocks from my grandmother's place and this story place where Bob Dylan used to play, et cetera, et cetera. And here's, Bill Monroe in this tiny place with Richard Green, Pete Rowan, and Lamar Greer in 1966. And before we went over to the Gaslight, we went over to the Folklore Center uh, on uh, on Sixth Avenue, which is again where Bob Nolan was hanging out five years before when he first came to New York. And uh, our guitar player and I, we took some instruments off the wall and just started jamming in the in the in the place. And Bill Keith was my huge hero at that point, and uh, my back was to the to the door and our guitar player looked up and went, because who walks in but Bill Keith and Peter Rowan. And I nervously went over to Bill Keith and shook his hand and said, hi, I don't remember if you remember me. That's how nervous I, was. I couldn't get the right words out. And he sat down with me for an hour and showed me things on the banjo. Mm -hmm. and he was hanging out with Pete Rowan. They, you know, I mean, they were buddies mm -hmm. and I don't know, he, he didn't have to do that, but here's this young kid who desperately wanted to learn to play and he showed me some really cool things and that's still used to this day and i don't know if that influenced me but i mean he was so generous how could i not show people things that you know if someone asks of course i'll show that you know you know and i, I gave bayless some lessons when he was 16 years old and you know he was very appreciative that i would show him my stuff as opposed to hoarding it and, and bayla does the same thing he'll show his Again, it, it passes down. If someone mm. learns some of Bayless things, he'll show them how he does it. I've talked to various people that said, yeah, I went up to Bayla and asked him how he did this, what this technique was. And he sat down with me after a show and showed me, probably because I did that. And I did that because Bill Keith did that, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I was talking to someone who they said that Earl Scruggs showed them how to play Sally Gooden. Hmm. They were somewhere in the 50s or early 60s or something. So, yeah. There's one banjo player, well known, but I won't mention his name. But he was doing a workshop, and he's not a teacher, but you know, very famous, older banjo player. And uh, he was giving this workshop, and he had someone who was sort of helping him field questions to interpret certain things. And uh, someone said, "Oh, how do you do that lick in that in Little Maggie?" And he said, "Oh, I can't tell you that. That's mine." You know, he's very <laughs> protective. This is mine. You know. And it, it's sort of like Bill Monroe playing, you know, had Flat and Scruggs in the band and they left him. And he never, it took many, many years for that grudge to go away. Well, of mm. course, if I had Scruggs in my band and they left me, I might be angry also. But, uh, and I think Bill looked at it, well, that was, that's my music, you know, I, you know, and these guys are taking my music and stealing it. I think that's sort of where that was coming from. And the Stanley brothers apparently would share the bill with Bill Monroe in the forties later forties and supposedly uh, or as this one story I heard that Bill's rehearsing in one room uh, with the uh, bluegrass boys and there's the Stanley brothers in the other room and they put a cup, you know, a glass to the wall to hear what Bill was doing and learn the tune and then go on stage opening up for Bill Monroe and play that song. 
Bill played it, who was going to play it in his set. So, you know, I think there was a big competitive spirit um, in those early days, yeah, which yeah. is absolutely not there anymore. So, no, and it very much seems to be a a, a, a world where people just exist to support each other to do whatever they can do and there's a you know it's even the experience of doing this podcast is you know i'm just some guy doing a podcast and i get in touch with people and say would you like to come and do an interview and people go yeah like and people are busy and so they can't always but there's no like there's no uh there's never any sense of well well how many people are going to listen to it and where's it going to go and like what what will i get from it it's people just go yeah it'd be really interesting to talk about that and that's such a for me, that's really exciting to get to be part of these kinds of conversations, but it's also just such an openness and a generosity and a, a sense of family that seems to extend to anybody who wants to be in it. Yeah. And who is this guy, Matt? Who are you anyway? What's, what's your background? <laughs> we didn't vet you, did we? No. I mean, you, you sent us one podcast to you, but... Uh, I'm exactly. I'm here to steal all your secrets. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, no, but you're, you're, I mean, I have to highly compliment you. You're a wonderful interviewer and you know your stuff. And that's really, uh, not everyone is, is, is well tuned in and is, is uh, well spoken as you. So thank you very much. That means a lot. Yeah. Um, so what I'd really like to know is what's next. You, you talked about wanting to do a similar, similar sort of project that, uh, focuses on lyrics and has a through line to it. Have you got something in mind yet? The things I have in, there are two things I have in mind, neither of which I, one I don't, I'd rather not talk about because it's not a reality. Well, I, I guess I can mention this. I, I, I don't think this is going to happen, but um, I grew up in Syracuse, New York, as I said, and there's, um, there are indigenous people. There's a tribe, a nation just below Syracuse called the Onondaga Nation. And I started thinking, I'd like to sort of pay tribute to Syracuse and explore that as you know, explore some aspect of indigenous people and what better than this nation that's just South of Syracuse. And, uh, I looked, uh, looked up their origin story, which is, would be a wonderful story to tell. Uh, but it's like, who am I to tell their story? You know, and I, I explored it a little bit, but I sort of decided and it would have been that sort of a story. Um, and it, it might happen at some point, but I just sort of feel like, you know, yeah, who am I to tell their story? I mean, obviously I would have them on it singing and have their spoken word on some level, but, and it could still happen. Uh, I have another thing that is, I, I don't want to talk about yet, but I'm very excited about because it's, uh, in the early stages, I'm very excited about it. What can I say? You know, I'm yeah. going to be mysterious about it. No, but, I, uh, I, ideas are delicate things. Sometimes you need to let them grow for a while before you, you know, put them under the microscope too much. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Cause with, with the shall we help project, I was talking about it six years, you know, after I'd been working on it for five or six years and it didn't come out for another six years. So yeah, this is, I have this project project coming out soon, whatever happened to that. So I'm going to keep <laughs> my mouth shut. Yeah. The one thing I've done some recording for is I've taken some Emily Dickinson poems and put some music to them and I've recorded four of those so far. Oh, cool. And, uh, I, 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 someone asked me to do a podcast in her bedroom, uh, to bring, she wasn't there at the time, <laughs> but, uh, to, uh, just bring creativity back into her, her, where she wrote her poems and why I was chosen as a banjo player. I'm not sure, but, um, you know, they would have poets or singers or whatever in her bedroom uh performing as they say uh and, and never mind anyway <laughs> i get a laugh that when i met that on stage once in a while but anyway so as i was driving up to do this podcast i thought well and i had my banjo with me my wife has a fiat she wanted to come along so i'm in the fiat trying to put i, I figured let me take one of her poems and put music to it so when i arrive i can do that and i uh, so i'm in the fiat with the banjo like going through the <laughs> sun such a small car and I wrote this song. Uh, she has a poem, the first line of which is frequently the woods are pink. And I just thought, what a cool first line. And so that, I mean, she's written so many poems, but I, I, I just grabbed that and wrote music to it. And uh, like I said, I've recorded four songs and uh, one which one of which with Abigail Washburn, uh, Bela's wife, who's, mm -hmm. who sings it. And uh, Jill Sobule sings. I'm not sure if you're familiar with her, but um, and a couple of other folks too, uh, just these wonderful singers. 
And so that's sort of an ongoing thing. Um, when I'm in the same place as someone, I'll go and record another tune. And, you know, I'd hope to have maybe eight to 10 songs or poems put to music. So that's, that's sort of an ongoing thing. Mm, and then she's been gigging with Michael Daves a bit recently as well. Yeah, yeah. I've been doing that for 10 years, something like that. I was playing a, a small festival in New York City uh, and went backstage. And here's this guy with an incredible voice and an incredible guitar player who was just playing by himself, you know, just warming up. And I said, who are you? Oh, I'm Michael Daves. Where do you live? Brooklyn. How long have you been here? Five years. And I could have been playing with this guy all this time. I never knew about him because to this day, he, I mean, he's on artist, artist works also, and he teaches a mm. lot. And so he doesn't tour that much here and there he does, but he's more of a teacher. And so he had, I just didn't know about him and anyway. So ever since then we've played music together and I've been playing a lot of music with Bruce Malski lately. Who's uh, are you familiar with his, mm, his yeah, yeah. incredible calling him an old time fiddler just doesn't do him justice because he does Swedish music, but you know, that's his, his roots are in the old time music and he's got this incredible groove and it's just such a mm. play with him. I've done two gigs with him this past weekend, as a matter of fact. And I also did a gig on Saturday with Dom Flemons, uh, from the Carolina chocolate drops, um, banjo player and plays, uh, guitar and, uh, bass drum plays the bass drum and, uh, harmonica and, uh, rootsy musician he's incredible yeah. so i just love playing in all these different situations keeps it interesting yeah yeah and i put a band together as well so it's it's a busy time well after quite a lot of time that probably wasn't busy enough that's it's delightful yeah. to hear that you're out and doing a bit of everything yeah <laughs> exactly yeah so long when we couldn't um I will send people to your website for more information about Shall We Hope and obviously I'll link to your Artist Works um, course. Is there anything anywhere else I should be sending people for information or updates? I think that's good. Yeah, no, Artist Works and TonyTrishka.com. Spell it any way you want. Well, I probably can spell it. Probably. <laughs> I'll try and I send it to the right one. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate Wonderful. That. Well, thank you so much for doing this. It's been a real treat for me. Um, well, I've really been enjoyed it. Treat. Really a great treat. Where are you right now, by the way? Uh, London in the UK. So in London? It's sort of, yeah, yeah. Night, getting on for night time here now. Yeah, I'll have to go over there one of these days. I've done the uh, Sore Fingers Summer Workshop, which mm. uh, is what they used to call it back when it was, and it was in April or May, so it wasn't even summertime. <laughs> I hope to come back there one of these days. So anyway, it's really been a pleasure. Hopefully uh, we'll get to meet sometime in person. Yeah, that'd be marvelous. Thanks so much. Right. I appreciate it a lot. Take care. Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. What an absolute treat that was. Um, there's going to be some links in the show notes to Tony's Artist Works course and his website as well. Um, I'll also stick a link into that Artist Works podcast that I mentioned at the beginning because that's a really good listen. You should definitely check that out. Um, I will see you next week with more, with more, two more interviews lined up, but there'll be some more tunes as well. Um, have a great week. I'll see you next time. Happy picking. Bluegrass Jam Along is proud to be sponsored by Collings Guitars and Mandolins, making some of the finest guitars and mandolins in the world since the 1970s. Visit collingsguitars.com and find out why.